uh, just before we begin, I'll draw your attention to this. Well, this is not really a slide you can read, I understand that, but you've got a handout that looks much like this, probably at the very back of your uh, stapled sets. And what I've endeavoured to do here, as you can see from your copies, is write the entire argument of the Book of Job all on one page. And in order to do that, I've, I've got the four characters, or the four characters, the four groups of characters of the, of the book across the column, across the top row, rather. So we've got Job, his friends, Elihu, and then God. These are the four main uh, speakers, if you like, of the book. And as far as the content of their words is concerned, we, I've split everything that's said into those issues relating to Job's suffering, Job's alleged sin, God's character, and the solution to the problem. As you'll appreciate, Job's view of the suffering and of sin, of his sin, is very different to what the friends say and what Elihu says, and even what God says. And the solution to the problem is very different between them all. So, if you were to simply read across each of these sections, for example, if you talk about Job's suffering, just read across each of these sections. By the time you get to God's position on Job's suffering, you've, you've resolved the entire issue of the suffering of Job. And similarly with uh, Job's sin, such as it might have been or might not have been, uh, God's character and well, what the solution to these things is. So hopefully you, know, you, you can uh, read through that and try and, uh, at a glance if you like, make sense of the entire argument of the book of Job. Take time to read it because it took me a long time to make it. <laughs> okay. Well, where are we? Here we are, here. We're now down to this last section. Remember the exhortation? We did the, the, the words of Elihu in his four speeches. So what we've got before us this afternoon is essentially two interactions between Yahweh and Job. Chapters, essentially chapters 38 and 39 and then chapters 40 and 41 where God speaks to Job twice. And you remember that these are uh, the companion section, if you like, to when God spoke to Satan twice right at the very start. So there's, a, as we said before, a symmetry about the book of Job. Well, as you can see, for 35 chapters now, because, well, yeah, 35 chapters from about chapter 3, this, this controversy has raged about the real purpose of Job's suffering. Did he sin or didn't he? And, and you know, how, how the argument has gone. And do you remember... Uh, in our last talk yesterday evening, Job had a major complaint against God. He wanted to take God to court because he felt he'd been mistreated, that God wasn't doing a good job of running the place, that wickedness went unhindered, and that the righteous suffered and they really ought not to do so. Well, Job basically was saying that, that God acts in an arbitrary and a destructive manner. I mean, there's chaos out there. Who can tell what's happening? God's unjust and he lets the wicked prosper. He can't be understood. He's silent. He confines wisdom to himself. You can't really find out why things happen around you. Not only that, but God's mistreating me, says Job. He's unjust. I'm a righteous man. And I'm not being treated as such. That makes God unrighteous in Job's eyes. Finally, not only is he personally righteous, but the only way to resolve this in Job's mind is that God declares it so. Essentially, God must vindicate Job publicly because he has been humiliated publicly. And that's where we left it yesterday. And if we had done, perhaps if we'd done the Elihu study as a study and we'd had slides, I would have shown you this, but I'll show it to you now. Elihu comes in and says, uh uh, not so fast. By all means, take your complaint to God if you wish, but I would suggest it's unwise. Why don't you bounce it off me first, and then see if you still want to go to God. So back comes Elihu. What was Elihu think of the fact that God acts in an arbitrary and destructive manner? Not true. God sustains life, says Elihu. He nourishes the earth. He uses the elements to judge, to give life, and to show mercy. Now, I didn't cover all of this with you this morning, but here's the verses. That's what Elihu says. There's nothing arbitrary about creation. That's his point. Secondly, God's unjust and lets the wicked prosper, says Job. No, not true, says Elijah. God is just. And there are unexplained judgments. People just disappear. That is God taking care of wickedness. God has... But wickedness still continues. Until Christ is in the earth, wickedness will continue. But uh, God has a break on it. And it will only continue so far. This is Elijah's point. 
Well, God is silent, says Job, and he can't be understood. Well, in fact, God's not silent at all. He communicates by dreams to man, through suffering, through chastisement, and by mediators. God does communicate with man. He's far from silent. You're just not listening, Job. That's life's point. God, in fact, is the perfect teacher, but he doesn't listen to the prayers of the inconsistent. He doesn't answer the prayer. That could be the problem with your lack of communication. A very astute answer by life. Well, Job says, God's mistreated me. Well, Elihu says, you are suffering because of sin. Not the sins which the friends have made up about you. Not this, this closet lifestyle of hypocrisy which the friends have theorised about. You're suffering because of, the, the, of what you've said in this debate. And if you had learned quicker, your suffering would have concluded. But look where you've taken the debate to. So, of course, it would be, it would be unfair for God to remove your suffering and leave you in this elevated, self-righteous position. Well, Job says, I want my day in court. I need God to tell me that I am, in fact, righteous. Well, Delight says, you've sinned. You're not right. You have sinned in this debate by being self-righteous and by being rebellious, by not learning quick enough. And then Elihu provides the audience Job desires. So Job wants vindication. Elihu says, fine, I'll give you vindication. I'm here to defend you. I'm here to vindicate you. Answer me if you can. Tell me if I've misrepresented you. Tell me if I've got it wrong. Silence from Job, you see. So this is the big... Elihu begins to answer Job's desire for vindication before everybody. Immediately, he says, would declare God's righteousness, righteousness to man. And that's exactly what Elihu began to do for Job. He'd make atonement for him. Elihu can't do this. But he'd give him, he'd give him hope of life. So Elihu explains the atonement to Job. He explains how Job can be fully reconciled to God through all of this. You see, the friends, compared with this, the three friends had a very immature an infantile approach to the truth. It was all about uh, exact retribution, and if you do this, God does that, and if you do this, God does that. And there wasn't really very much more complex than that. Elihu's added an entire dimension to this, which has marvellously helped Job prepare for the interview with God. As I say, if Elihu hadn't said this, and if Job had gone into, this inter- into the interview without these answers, where do you think it would have placed him before God? I'm going to suggest in a terrible, perhaps an irreversible position. All right. Well, this is the structure of chapters 38 to 42. Come back to chapter 38 because we're going to start here. There's been a great storm, as you know, and the rain started to come down. So there they are, standing in the darkness, in, I suppose, the pouring rain. The, the, the sun's completely obscured. The only light they've got is from the Shekinah glory above them, and the voice of God is booming over the storm, the thunder and the lightning, which is crashing all around them. And there they are, in this, in this remarkably cocoon scene, these three friends, plus Elihu, plus Job, and God overshadowing them. Now I'm going to explain everything else that Elihu hasn't yet explained. Get up thy loins, verse 3 of chapter 38, God says, like a man, I will demand of thee, answer thou me. All right, Job, you wanted the interview, you wanted your day in court, now it's come. I hope you're prepared for it. And as you can see here, between chapters 38 and 41, God's going to speak twice. There's the first speech, chapter 38 and 39, and here's the second speech, chapter 40 and 41. Chapter 42 is like the epilogue of the book. Now, in the first speech, you can see, just, just at a glance, you can see how this breaks up. Pretty much, well, there's a bit of a problem, you know. If you to look at chapter 38, the chapter break comes after thir- chapter 38, verse 41. The chapter break really ought to be after chapter 38, verse 38. Because the first 38 verses of chapter 38 describe the inanimate creation. The earth, the sea, the sun, the light, the dark, the weather, the stars, the clouds... All the physical creation about us. From verse 39 of chapter 38, all the way through to the end of chapter 39, you've got the animate creation, or the animals described. And so unfortunately, the chapter breaks... How do they get that wrong? It's pretty clear when you look at it, but the chapter breaks in a very bad spot. So the 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 chapter break really ought to be, as I say, after chapter 38, verse 38, and that would pull all of the animals 
into chapter 39. All right, no problem with that. Then there's a, a small confession by Job in the first five verses of chapter 40. And then we have God speaks again. And we've got more animals described in chapter 41. The behemoth, which I believe is the hippopotamus, and the leviathan, which is the crocodile. And then, of course, we have another confession by Job and the ephemeral. So you can see God's opening challenge, the first speech, Job's confession. God's opening challenge, the second speech, Job's confession. And then the conclusion of the book, you see? So that's how this last section breaks up. No mystery there, really, pretty simple, but extremely powerful. And I suppose the obvious question that arises from this is, you can see what Job's allegations against God are. How is this going to answer that? I mean, have you ever read the, the, these last chapters of Job before and thought, what does it all mean? What, what is this supposed to mean? I mean, so, so Job's self-righteous. You could glean that without too much work because Allah who just says you're self-righteous. So in order to deal with Job's self-righteousness, God gives him a gives him a, a burst on the physical creation, a burst on the animal creation, and then a second burst on the animal creation. As a result of which, Job repents in dust and ashes and says, you're right, I'm wrong, the whole book concludes. What this must mean, I mean how, did that, how does that answer? How does this answer a man who's self-righteous? Obviously, there's a riddle here. There's something that has to be unlocked here. Because... It simply appears, you know, when I first read this, I thought, I thought the answer was that, that Job accuses God of being a poor ruler of the world, that God doesn't know what he's doing, that he's indiscriminate about how he treats people, and that he can't be understood by his creation. And that God simply comes in and says, well, Job, where were you when I created the earth? Do you know how, to, how the clouds were? Do you know how you know, the, 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 the tides in the sea are bounded by the seashore? Do, do you know these things? Do you, know, do you feed the creation? Do you know how the animals operate? As if to say, Job, if you don't understand these things, you've got no right to tell me I'm not a wise creator. As if, you know, as if God simply bombarded Job with questions Job couldn't possibly understand and pushed him into a corner and sidestepped the issue about righteousness. I mean, that's almost how it reads. But it can't be that, because that wouldn't convince Job any more than it would have convinced you and me. What this must mean, as I say, therefore, is that there's a code in here. Well, this is the code. There's a riddle here. And that this, in fact, is the story of righteousness somehow, because that's Job's big issue. And this is the answer to that issue. So what we're going to do now is a bit of detective work and unravel what the story is of this explanation by God to Job's allegation that he's more righteous than God. You see? You see the problem? And therefore, there must be a solution here to that question somehow. All right, so what does God actually say? Here's the first speech. So, if I go back, here's the first speech here, the inanimate creation, the physical creation. Well, here it is. And you can see that what we're talking about here is the, the earth, the sea, the sun, the, the, the breadth and depth of the world, light and dark, the weather, the stars, the clouds. This is pretty much to where I've broken it, chapter 38, verse 38. This is the first major speech in the lion's share of chapter 38 of Job. Now look what God says here. Verse 4. Where wast thou, Job, when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare if thou hast understanding. Who hath laid the measures thereof, if thou knowest? Or who hath stretched the line upon it? So God picks up now where Elihu left off, dealing with the creation. Remember, Elihu never really finishes speaking, does he? Elihu, in fact, just gets drowned out by the noise of the storm, and then the voice of God comes in over top. Elihu's speaking right up to the end of chapter 37. And then just God comes straight in over top. So this is one, from Job's point of view, almost one continuous conversation. He can't answer Elihu. Elihu's prepared for him to hear the voice of God. He can't answer Elihu, and then God comes straight in. So Job's feeling pretty small as this great light shines above them, and the voice of God comes down upon them. 
What did Job know about the formal function of the earth? That's what God asks in these verses. Clearly the earth was made to a plan. Clearly it's operating to a plan. It's maintaining a balance that supports life. What did Job know about that? Even the angels rejoiced when creation was complete, he says. But Job thought he knew enough to criticise how God ran the world. Not that God's trying to overwhelm Job with the complexity of these questions, but these are the answers to Job's questions. All right, Job, what about the sea? Well, what do you know about the sea, Job? Verse 8. Who has shut up the sea with doors when it break forth as if it had issued out of the womb? Verse 10. And break up for it my decreed place and set bars and doors and said, Hitherto shalt thou come but no further and here shall thy proud waves be stayed. What's the point? The point is that the natural elements have boundaries. Jeremiah 5 verse 22 says, I've placed the sand for a bound of the sea by a perpetual decree that it cannot pass it. And though the waves thereof toss themselves, yet they cannot prevail. Though they roar, yet they cannot pass over it. So God has put the sand for a boundary on the sea. It's it's designed that way. The sea can never breach the beach. That's his point. The sea can never ever overrun the land again. Bear in mind, it's done it before. The sea has overrun the land before. And God says in Jeremiah, I'll put a boundary for the sea. The sea will, will the sea will stay in its place. There is not chaos out there, Job. It's not uncontrolled out there in creation. I have created it specifically like this. All right, says Job. That's fine. But the wicked prosper. I look around. Nothing ever happens to them. Nothing goes wrong for the wicked. They go to bed happy. Oh, says God. Think about this, Job. Who do you think it was that told the sun to rise? You say, what's the, how does this answer the question? Look at verse 12. Hast thou commanded the morning since thy days, and caused the day spring to know his place? The day spring is the sun. Have you commanded the sun to know when to go up and when to go down? No, you haven't. Well, so what? Verse 13. That it might take hold of the ends of the earth, that the wicked might be shaken out of it. So what is the saying? Well, you can imagine the earth like a blanket with all its crinkles in it as the hills, and the sun comes up over the side of this blanket, and it, it, it plays its light out upon the blanket, and that shakes all the wicked out of the blanket. Because what happens? Well, men love darkness because their deeds are evil. As soon as the sun comes up, all the criminals run for cover. God says, I've done that. The sun rises every day to control wickedness in the earth. You think the wicked go unchecked? Do you think there's, there's, it's chaos out there? Not at all. I've made it like this. And Job's thinking, I've never thought about it like that. But it is true. <laughs> and it's true. What do we have street lights for? Not just so you can drive your car. Light dispels darkness. Light dispels wickedness. And God says, I'm making the sun rise to control wickedness. Job, you just don't know how, you've got no idea about the wisdom that I've put in place, Job. Well, says Job, sure. But who knows this? I mean, who have you told this to? I mean, you're incomprehensible. Who can understand what you do? You see, this is one of his points to God. In chapter 28, he says, look, if I go to the depth of the earth or the depth of the sea, I can't find wisdom. Verse 16, God says, well, Job, hast thou entered into the springs of the sea? Or hast thou walked in search of the depth? Have the gates of death been opened unto thee? Or hast thou seen the doors of the shadow of death? I go to those places, Job. I go to the greatest depths of everywhere. I know what's happening everywhere. Job. And you won't understand that any more than you can go to those depths yourself, which of course you can't do. The implication here, of course, is that God's in complete control. He knows what he's doing. And he does have man's best interests at heart. It's interesting, you know, Revelation 20 and verse 13 says this, And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and the books were open. You see, God's wisdom extends to the depth and the breadth, and he uses it to save men. And I might add, Job, says God, nature is not as much out of control as you think. The elements are used for judgment. I've got complete control over the elements. They're used for judgment. Verse 22. 
Hast thou entered into the treasures of the snow? Hast thou seen the treasures of the hail, which are preserved against the time of trouble, against the day of battle and war? There is a day when wickedness will be eradicated, and it will be my creation that does it. Now you know in Ezekiel 38, hailstones, fire, earthquake is what destroys the Gogian invader. It's the issues of nature which are played out upon the northern army that God uses. He says, I've got complete control over the creation. And I might tell you, there's latent power within the creation which no man has ever seen, but which one day I'm going to turn the key and unlock it, and men will be destroyed the world over, says God. Don't pretend that creation's out of control. If it was out of control, you wouldn't be standing here right now, because look at the power that creation's got, that the natural creation's got. Job, you just don't know what you're saying. Verse 26. And he says, I cause it to rain on the earth, where no man is. In the wilderness, wherein there is no man. Creation is not just reserved for judgment, Job. It also saves itself. It it preserves life in itself. You're not out there in the wilderness, Job. No one's out there in the wilderness, feeding these animals, raining on them. But I'm out there. I'm doing that, Job. And (laughs) Job's Job's going like this. (laughs) As he's listening to this, you see, he can't believe what he's hearing. So the point is, God is simply not overwhelming Job with, with hard questions that Job can't answer. He's telling him how he thinks. He's telling him how he thinks about his creation and how he's going to use his creation. Verse 31. Job's already said, back in chapter 9, verse 9, that God made Arcturus, Orion, and Pleiades, that God made the stars. Well, look at verse 31. He says to Job, Job, canst thou bind the sweet influences of Pleiades or loose the bands of Orion? Now, the sweet influence, I don't know where this translation came from. The, the, the sweet influence is the word ought to be cluster. Job, canst thou bind the cluster of Pleiades or loose the bands of Orion? Now, what does it mean? Well, the Pleiades in, in Greek mythology were seven Greek sisters. And there are seven stars in the constellation of Pleiades. But they're, they're not related to each other, these stars. They just happen to be in the same spot in the sky. But they're billions of miles apart. And as the year goes by, they move closer and further away. They go like this, but they stay in in a cluster, but they they don't stay exactly the same distance away from each other. And God says, can you fix them? Can you bind them? Of course not. And the Orion is a twin star. These two stars orbit each other like this. And by a peculiar relationship between their gravitational forces, they stay always the same distance apart. Can you loose them? Can you bind Pleiades and loose Orion, Job? Can you do that? And Job, well, of course, there's no chance that Job can possibly do this. What's the point? The point is that God made the stars and he controls them. Greater light to rule the day, a lesser light to rule the night. Everything does as it's told. Everything operates as it's designed. And if God can can control the big influences, he can obviously control the smaller influences as well. And in conclusion here, in this section, he returns to the design of the earth. Verse 36. Who has put wisdom in the inward parts? The RSV says the clouds. Who's put wisdom in the clouds? Or who's given understanding to the heart? The RSV says the mist. Who's put wisdom in the clouds? Who's given understanding to the mist, he says? There's design on the earth, that's the point. Creation's not haphazard. It doesn't happen by mistake. God controls everything. You know, I made the comment a moment ago that he's not just bewildering Job with complex arguments that Job can't hope to match God on. He's telling Job how he thinks. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, look at this, verse 8. The sea was born, in verse 8. It issued out of the womb. The sea was born. It was wrapped, the earth, in verse 9, was wrapped in swaddling bands. In verse 11, the earth was instructed in the way of life. The sun, in verse 12, was given a work to do. Light was born, in verse 21. Rain has a father, in verse 28. Ice comes from the womb, in verse 29. And and when it all began, in verse 7, the angels rejoiced. The morning stars sang together. Do you know what? God treats this earth 
as his offspring. You know, when God brought his own son into the world, his mother wrapped him in swaddling clothes. He was instructed in the way of life. God taught him wisdom and gave him a job and he was there for the blessing of man and the angels rejoiced at his creation. That's exactly what he does with his children. So God says, this, this whole earth is a physical type of my son which is to come. And I've wrapped this thing here in swaddling clothes. That's exactly what it says. Where did I read it? Verse 9. I wrapped the earth in swaddling clothes just like I wrapped my son. And I taught the earth in wisdom just like I taught my son. And he's there for the benefit of man just like my son. That's how I think about creation, Job. Job's completely... You'd never think that God would talk like that. Well, that's the end of um, of that section in chapter 38. All right, what about the animals? Well, here's the animate creation. Amazing, isn't it? Is <laughs> the animate creation. And here they are, and what you notice immediately is all the animals occur in pairs. So he talks about the lion and the raven and the wild goat, the, the deer, the, the wild ass, the unicorn, which is an ox, and uh, now extinct wild ox, the peacock, the ostrich, or the stork, the peacock's actually the stork, the ostrich, The horse, the hawk, the eagle. These are all the animals of Job chapter 39, or the end of chapter 38, and all of Job chapter 39. And each of these animals occurs in pairs. And the ostrich, in fact, occurs twice. The ostrich ostrich is is compared to the stork in terms of motherhood, or lack thereof. And the ostrich is compared to the horse in terms of fearlessness and speed. So the ostrich occurs twice. And as soon as you see that, Everything occurs in pairs. The lion, the raven, the goat, the hind, or the deer, the wild ass, the wild ox, the ostrich and the horse, and the ostrich and the stork, and the hawk and the eagle. And whilst it's true that you could simply read this chapter as a great list of how God cares for his creation, there's a lot more to it than that. There must be. Because as Job completes this first interview with God, he responds. He responds, and then God, having done this, comes back with another pair of animals in chapter 40, the Leviathan and the bear moth. So there's no coincidence that these are all in pairs, because in chapter 40, there's going to be another pair of animals that that gets um, given to Job to consider. And you think, all right... (laughs) What is the point here? What is the point of all of these animals? Well, you've got a clue. And here's the clue in chapter 40 and verse 15. You've got a clue about what God means when he talks about these animals. I told you, it's written in code. He's got to break the code. Here it is here. Verse 15 of chapter 40. The bear moth, the hippopotamus. Behold now, bear moth, which I made with thee. What does that mean? Behold the hippopotamus which I made with thee. Well, you could say perhaps that the, that the hippopotamus was made on day six, and that happens to be also when man was made on day six. But so what? What's the point of telling us that? There must be an inference here, brothers and sisters and young people, that in some way the bear moth represents man. That he's like a man in some way. Well, it's a good theory. What, what else can you offer me? But I'll offer you this. Come across the page. Chapter 41, verse 34. The last verse in chapter 41. Now here's Leviathan, the crocodile. He beholdeth all high things. He is king over all the children of pride. Now there's no doubt about that. Crocodiles don't have pride. Animals don't have pride. He represents man. The crocodile represents man. The hippopotamus represents man. All these animals represent men. Ah, we've broken the code, you see. We've broken the code, okay? Come back to chapter 38. End of chapter 38. Let's look at them. Here's the first couplet. Chapter 38, verse 39. Wilt thou hunt the prey for the lion, or fill the appetite of the young lions, when they crouch in their dens and abide in the covert to lie in wait? Who provideth for the raven his food? When his young ones cry unto God, when they wander for lack of meat. 
And immediately, immediately here there are implications for Job. Because the lioness kills to feed her young and leaves the rest for the ravens. So the noblest of beasts, noblest of beasts and the meanest of birds, yet one helps the other. And in the context of nature, none of us blinks at that. We say, that's fine, that's how nature works. Uh, but it raises the question of suffering and justice, doesn't it? Because in killing for its young and feeding the raven, the prey suffered as an innocent victim, didn't it? There is an animal here which has suffered in order to nourish the lion and the raven. Well, what's the prey? Verse 1, chapter 39. Knowest thou the time when the wild goats of the rock bring forth, or canst thou mark when the hinds do carve? These are the prey. These are the animals that the lions kill. Verse 4. Their young ones are in good liking. They grow up with corn. They go forth and return not to them. Ah, that's interesting. Because these are animals of prey, but God cares for them. And in verse 4, what's the point? The point is they breed quickly. The young ones can pretty much run from the day they're born. They grow up very fast. They leave home very early. They don't come back. They are completely independent. So, it's, you know, it would be a problem, wouldn't it? If the goats had a number of young, and the young took 20 years to nurture to adulthood like they do for humans... You kill, kill a goat population immediately, they become extinct overnight. It's not how it's been created, though. The goats, they breed very fast. The, the young are almost independent from the day they're born, and within a very short while, they, they go and never come back and do their own thing. So, God has created the goats to be independent, that they might be food for the lion. And the lion, going about its business, feeds its young, eats what it wants, leaves the rest, and the ravens are fed because the lion doesn't eat the whole carcass. Now think of that. So the lion kills the deer, the raven feeds off the kill as an unintended beneficiary. Satan afflicted Job. Three friends are going to learn enormous lessons as unintended beneficiaries. They know about as much about Satan as the raven does of the lion. The raven doesn't know where the carcass came from, he just comes along and picks the meat off the bones. Uh, but did God provide for Job? Does God provide for the deer and the goats? Absolutely. Absolutely. And those wild goats, you know, these wild goats here, these, these are very different sort of people to what Job was. Job's got nurses, he's got servants, he's got people to run after him. These wild goats, they're poor. They're poor people. They've got to fend for themselves. They live life tough. They survive. They've got big families. No chance of ever making them extinct. They're happy. Their kids run off very, very early on in life and go and start their own families and do their own thing. Oh yes, the lions take some of them, but they breed so fast, it doesn't matter. Verse 5, the wild ass. What about him? Who sent out the wild ass free? Who's loosed the bands of the wild ass? Here's a person that can't be tamed. He's a person that can't be instructed. He's willful, you see. He won't listen. He's a brother, actually, in ecclesial life. That's what he is. Well, he might be a sister. But let's say he's a brother. <laughs> Genesis 16, verse 12. Ishmael was a man like this. A wild ass of a man, Genesis says. God says so in Genesis. So that's what Ishmael would be like. Wild, unruly, fiercely independent. You can't work with him. It's got to be done his way or it won't be done any way at all. And so he lives in isolation. He can't, he can't relate to people. He can't, he can't really handle a big ecclesia. He just wants a little meeting way out in the wop somewhere. Scorns them. Look at verse 7. He scorns the multitude of the city. He doesn't go to Bible schools because he doesn't like crowds. He, he might not be unfaithful. He just can't handle a big gathering. They exist, don't they? They exist. He lives a simple life. He lives a humble life. People in society mean nothing to him. If you upset him, you'll find out very quickly. He's got a problem with crowds. He'd just rather be out there by himself. Verse 10. The unicorn, or as he is, the wild ox. Canst thou bind the wild ox with his band in the furrow? Or will he harrow the valleys after thee? Here's somebody with all the potential in the world. Like this, this creature is immensely strong. I mean... 
you get one of those, you can get rid of all your tractors. He can pull anything. All the potential in the world, but not the will. Immensely powerful, but he'll never ever work for you. Not because he's willful, not because he's like a wild ass, a wild, wild ass rather, but because he's just uncooperative. He just doesn't. He's just contrary. He just doesn't like doing it. So you can, uh, therefore, verse 11, who will trust him? You can never rely on him. He'll never ever deliver what he says. If you could harness him, brothers and sisters, he would do the work of ten men. But who can tell him? If you try and force him, you try and force him, he'll mow you down. They exist. I don't say this is a good characteristic. It, it is real life. And the ostrich, contrasted with the peacock here, or is, it, is the peacock ought to be the stork? The ostrich and the stork. Verse 13. Gave us there the goodly wings unto the stork, or wings and feathers to the ostrich. Well, here's the thing about the stork. She's the classic picture of maternity. She's given her life to motherhood and apple pie. I mean, that's the sort of sister she is, isn't she? If you skin your knee, she's the person you want to go and see. But look at her in comparison with the ostrich. <laughs> I mean, flappy, showy, a scatterbrain, like a complete scatterbrain. We call him, look, God's deprived her of wisdom, he says in verse 17. She actually has no brains. That's what she's like. She's, you know, she's just not the sharpest knife in the rack. That's how she is. Lives her whole life with her head in the sand. But she might be in the ecclesia. And she might contribute well only to undo everything she's done with some foolish action or some foolish word. And she's got kids. Oh, don't ask about the kids. Verse 16. She's hardened against her young ones as though they were not hers. The kids have almost got to bring themselves up. Oh, that the stork adopted them. But it's just not how it is. And life is like that. You see, people are like that. Not good, she needs to change. But some people are born starting from this position. And the horse, verse 19, hast thou given the horse strength? Hast thou clothed his neck with thunder? Here's a a man who's born for the battle. Or a woman for that matter. Like, these are like the trade unionists of life. Born for the battle, not intimidated by anything. You can't scare him. You threaten him, only raises the stakes. Verse 22, he mocketh at fear and is not affrighted. Neither turns he back from the sword. Here's somebody who looks for conflict. And if there's no conflict, it's about time to create some. Loves it. But he's got to be careful, you see. If there's a, if there's a, a scrap on, like, particularly if there's an ecclesial issue on, he's a, it could be a very trusty ally. But he could spend his life fighting. The problem is, if the battle ever finishes, he's likely to bolt right out of the truth. That happens too. This is, this, this, these are the members of your ecclesia in Job 39. They're the members of my ecclesia. This is what we're like, brothers and sisters. And the section closes with the hawk and the eagle in verses 26 onwards. Doth the hawk fly by wisdom and stretch her wings toward the south? Doth the eagle mount up at thy command and make her nest on high, he says? This is the wisdom of migration and the wisdom of habitation. One bird for some reason, just knows where it's got to go in life. And the other bird knows how to protect itself. It knows where to put the best investments. It knows to build its house high up on a cliff that no one could get into it. It just instinctively is smart about some of those life decisions. But once again, they're creatures of prey. And isn't it a funny thing that often amongst us, and often in life, The people who are the sharpest, the people that make the smartest decision, the people that can see issues for what they are, often don't have a lot of feelings for other people. These animals, they're smart. They're extremely smart. But they're creatures of prey. Their young ones, verse 30, drink blood. It's a funny thing, isn't it? What's what's God shown Job? Oh, there's my... These are my pairs. I'm not sure why I probably may not be. There's the pairs of the animals, and here's the last pair. It's, uh... Oh, there you are. That's what God's shown Job. Here's the lessons. And here's the allegations that Job made. So here we are. Job, you say that God is a, a poor ruler of the world. Well, 
God's power in creation is constructive. It's controlled. And it's used for the benefit of all creation. That's God's answer. Joe, you say God's unjust and unless the wicked prosper. Well, God, in fact, restrains sin. The wicked don't have carte blanche control over the whole world. That's just not true. The sun rises and stops that. But God's long-suffering. He doesn't rejoice in the destruction of the wicked. Oh, that he would convert the wicked. Otherwise, where would we be, brothers and sisters? But he will one day destroy them. God's silent. He can't be understood. Well, that's because man can't plumb the dimensions of the physical world. If he can't... If, if man can't plumb the dimensions of the physical world, how can he possibly question God's activities in the moral world? Man, isn't, man just doesn't know enough. He doesn't make enough observation of God from the physical creation about him. Well, Job says, you're treating me cruelly and unjustly. It's not fair what you're doing to me. Ah, uh, Job, animals represent people. I care for everything, God says, including those that you would find undesirable people. Some people need careful handling in order to be saved. In order to achieve this, sometimes the innocent must suffer for the guilty. It happens in the animal world. It happens in the human world. God's purpose is a lot bigger than just you and me, you see. God's treatment of Job is for the salvation of others. It is not a personal animosity towards Job. Look at the code, you see. Look what God's telling Job as he unfolds his explanation of creation. Job could never have dreamed of an answer like this, you see. Well, chapter 40 now begins us to, brings us to the, the conclusion of the first discussion between Yahweh and Job. And in verse 1, moreover, Yahweh says to Job, answers Job and says, Shall he that contendeth with the Almighty instruct him? He that reproveth God, let him answer it. Job answers Yahweh and says, Oh, I'm vile. What shall I answer thee? Oh, lay my hand upon my mouth. Oh, once have I spoken, but I, won't an- but I will not answer. Yea, twice I'll proceed no further. I've got nothing to add. I wish, you know, back in chapter 34 and verse 37, Elihu told Job that he'd multiplied words against God. Job says here in verse 5, I don't want to say another word. I've said way too much already. But God speaks again, because you see, even if Job's finished, God hasn't, God's only just begun. There's another speech coming. God hasn't finished yet. And the reason there's another speech coming is because of this. God hasn't yet answered all Job's issues. He hasn't yet answered all the allegations that Job's made. He hasn't really dealt, in fact, with this whole issue of righteousness and Job's desire for personal vindication. That hasn't actually been touched just yet. So even if Job's finished speaking, even if Job doesn't want to say any more, God's got still more to say, you see. Verse 6, the answer is Yahweh unto Job out of the whirlwind. Gird up thy loins now like a man. Now that's just what he said in chapter 38. But he says, Job, don't sit down yet. We haven't finished. Get up your loins like a man. I'll demand of thee and declare thou answer me. I'm going to ask you questions now and you better have answers, Job. Well, it's going to get quite serious. Wilt thou also disannul my judgment? Wilt thou condemn me that thou mayest be righteous? Oh, there's the issue. We still haven't dealt with this issue, Job, that you think you're more righteous than me. That's what we're going to deal with here, you see? The next speech is going to deal with it. We haven't got to the bottom of of my righteousness versus yours, Job. the The discussion between us has still got to continue. Well, verse 10. This is what God says to him. Deck thyself now with majesty and excellency. Array thyself with glory and beauty. Cast abroad the rage of thy wrath. And behold, everyone that's proud and abase him. Don't just be angry. Do something serious, Job. Remove the pride from proud people. Look on everyone that's proud and bring him low. And tread down the wicked in their place. Hide them in the dust together. Bind their faces in secret. If you can do that, then... Well, I also confess to thee that thine own right hand can save thee. If you can do that, then you can achieve personal righteousness, which might mean that I owe you something. But if you can't do this, if you can't control these most basic and strongest human emotions, you're not going to win this contest. And we're scratching our heads, brothers and sisters, thinking, what is God about here? What, What is this supposed to mean? And again, we've got a clue. Look at verse 10. 
you see, what we do is we, we may not know Job very well, and we forget, we forget, no, no, the book of Job very well, we forget what has been said, but God hasn't forgotten a word. He hasn't, forgot an, he hasn't forgotten an emotion of what has been said before. Verse 10 is an allusion to something. Deck thyself now with majesty and excellency. Array thyself with glory and beauty. God is referring to something that Job has said. And you come back with me to chapter 29. Job said something in chapter 29. And God's pulled it up here in chapter 40. He's going to take him to task about it, very specifically. In Job chapter 29 and verse 14, we have the allusion to it in chapter 40, verse 10. 29 verse 14, Job says, now remember this is, this is the first or the second of Job's monologues, the first chapter of the second monologue, when Job talks about what things were like before the suffering began. We looked at this last night. Verse 14 he says, I put on righteousness and it clothed me. My judgment was as a robe and a diadem. Now that's interesting because God has just said to him, Deck thyself now with majesty and excellency. Array thyself with glory and beauty. Now that's what he's referring to. Job clothed himself in righteousness. So God says, fine, get dressed. Show me your character at its best. Come and stand before me and let me see you. Job 29, as I say, was Job's past glory. Look how things were before all these calamities of God came upon him. Remember verse 15? I was eyes to the blind, I was feet to the lame. I was a father to the poor, and the cause which I knew not I searched out. So I was a master of hospitality and ecclesial welfare. That's what Job says. And it was true. Verse 17. I break the jaws of the wicked and pluck the spoil out of his teeth. I hated oppression and I dealt with it. Summarily, I dealt with oppression. Verse 18. I said... I'm going to die in my nest. I'll multiply my days as the sand. My root was spread out by the waters. The dew lay upon my branch all night, he says. My glory was fresh in me. My bow was renewed. I was like a great tree, sending its roots hither and thither. Long life, the family spread out before me. That was my hope for the future. Verse 24. If I laughed on people, if I smiled at them, they believed it not. The light of my countenance they cast not down. If I acknowledge people, they treasured it, that I had done this for them. I don't say that in an arrogant sense, but that's the reality of the position I held, he says. Look, verse 25, I, and look at this carefully, I chose out their way. I sat chief. I dwelt as a king in the army, as one that comforts the mourners, he says. That's interesting. I was a chief. And... I was a king. Now you come back you come back to chapter forty. That is very interesting. I was a chief and I was a king. Job chapter forty. Verse nineteen. Here's the bear moth. I was a chief and I was a king, says Job. In chapter forty, verse nineteen, of the bear moth, of the hippopotamus it says, He is chief of the ways of God. Oh, so the bear moth, the chief. Job chapter 41, verse 34. Behold, Leviathan is king over all the children of pride. So bear moth's a chief, and Leviathan's a king. And Job sat as a chief and as a king, dressed in his self-righteousness. Now we already know that animals represent people. Can you see what God's doing to Job, brothers and sisters? Job, if I go back there, which one are you? Which one are you? Well, let me tell you, Job, you're none of them. I've got another one for you. Another animal for you. And what he's going to do here is he introduces two more, two more animals. And you can read the characteristics of these animals yourselves. But there's been some debate about, you know, is this really the elephant, not the hippopotamus? I think the hippopotamus fits best. Is this really the crocodile, or is it some kind of dinosaur, because you've got a reference here to smoke coming out of its nostrils? I actually think it's the crocodile, and the smoke is probably steam coming out of the nostrils of the crocodile. Not too much mystery there. The point is, and this is the big point, this animal is invincible. And this animal is infinitely hostile can't be tamed 
can't be marshaled, you cannot do anything with a crocodile. You start to think about the characteristics of a crocodile and, well, release one in this room here. Think about your reaction to it. Okay. The behemoth, the hippopotamus, is the epitome of strength. Look at him. Verse 16. Chapter 40, 40, verse 16. He's the epitome of strength. Lo now, his strength is in his loins, and his force is in the navel of his belly. I mean, what can't this animal push over, brothers and sisters? He moveth his tail like a cedar. The sinews of his stones, or his thighs as it is, are wrapped together. An enormously, enormously powerful animal. Everything about him is powerful, you see, and he's immovable. Nothing can intimidate him. And he lives in the river, and when the river floods, well, what does he do? When the river floods, he leans into it, he opens his mouth, and he drinks it down. And what if it floods with a tsunami? He opens his mouth wider, and he drinks it down. That's what he's like, you see. Verse 23, Behold, he drinketh up a river, and hasteth not. He trusted that he can draw up Jordan into his mouth. Now, the reference here to Jordan has led people to think about this being the elephant because there are no hippopotamuses in in, in Jordan. But it says here that he can draw up Jordan, that Rotherham says, as though he could draw up a Jordan. It's actually a reference to the Nile hippopotamus, just as though this is a reference to the, just like this is a reference to the Nile crocodile. And the Nile hippopotamus could drink up a Jordan, that is the equivalent equivalent of a Jordan in his mouth. That's the point. Well, how does this how does this work? I'll come back to that and I'll show you something in a minute. This well, Leviathan. Here, the crocodile, the epitome of untrustworthiness, of aggression, of fear. Look, verse eight, chapter forty one, verse eight. Lay thy hand upon him. Remember the battle, do no more. What does that mean? (laughs) Touch him once, learn a lesson, don't touch him again. That's what it means, isn't it? It's very clear. Don't fool around with this animal. Just do not fool around with this animal. Verse 14, who can open the doors of his face? Now you know, if you get a crocodile and you close his mouth... You can put a rubber band around it and he can't open it. You open his mouth, there is nothing you can do to stop it shutting. Infinitely powerful bite on the animal. So you can't, you can't do it. Verse 15, his scales are his pride, shut up together as with a close seal. He's, he's, and before the origin of, of guns, you couldn't get him through, through the height of a crocodile. You couldn't, you'd have to turn him over to kill him. You couldn't get him through the top. Verse 33 of... Um, uh, Job, 30, uh, Job 41. Upon earth there is not his like who was made without fear. Now this is interesting. When Noah was told that he could control creation after he got off the ark at the flood, he was, he was told that all creation was subject to him. He could subdue everything. He could now eat the herb, he could also eat meat. All animals would run from him. And for the most part that's true. This fella will not run from him. It's a fact. Australia's got a lot of crocodiles. They're not scared of people. They'll come and hunt you out. There's only maybe a crocodile and the polar bear perhaps is similar. We don't have much contact with those. Of course, they only live in one place. But crocodiles are in a number of countries. These, most animals, even lions and tigers, unless they are pushed for food or, or need water or unless you get in the way of them and they're young or something like that where they are upset, they might attack you. Otherwise, they will, they will, they will steer clear of humankind. Crocodiles... They'll come down the street. There's no, there's no question. They are not at all scared of people. Upon earth, nothing is like him, Scripture says. He'll come looking for you. And once he's got a taste of you, he'll come back for more. This is amazing, this animal. Quite amazing. <laughs> there's a key verse here, chapter 40, verse 12. Here's the key verse that puts these two animals together and relates them to Job. Chapter 40 of Job, verse 12. Look upon everyone that's proud, be him off, and bring him low and tread down the wicked Leviathan in his place. You see? These are the two animals that Job can't control. Pride 
and sin. A part of his character. A part of his character. Now, how does this work? Well, look at this. Here's Theomoth. He represents man. He's got a great strength, but he's not an especially violent animal. I mean, if you upset him, the hippopotamus will attack you. There's no question, and they do. But he doesn't run around trying to attack things. He just eats grass and stuff. He could endure a great trial, but he wasn't a threat to people. Job had enormous resources to endure trial. He thinks he's better than he is, though. He's got, he, well, he's got, he's got a, a tail. He thinks his tail's sick. He's only got a little tail. very strong. It's only a little tail. And it's like a propeller underwater behind him to get rid of um, excrement and so forth. But he thinks that this tail's very big. Job, he glories in things of small account. In chapter 29, we read them. He's running the ecclesia. He's taking care of everything. He's, he's the benefactor of the ecclesial world in that part, of the, uh, that part of the ecclesial world, at least. But God says, well, that's good. I mean, there's no problem with that. But uh, listen, the bigger things of life, pride and sin, you do not have under control any more than anybody else. He's self-confident. He can move unmolested against predators. Nothing can touch the hippopotamus. Nothing could touch Job. He walked as a king. He had an army of supporters. Nothing could possibly touch Job. He lives, this hippopotamus lives in circumstances of blessing and protection and comfort. It describes it there exactly the same as Job. He remains confident in the midst of disaster. Exactly the same as Job. And he's best overcome by stealth. The only way you could ever catch a hippopotamus is to trick him. Don't try and take him when he's watching you. Same for Job. <laughs> and God says, the friends come on at Job and go, boom, right in front of him. He goes, ping, ping. God comes at him and says, I'll tell you a story. There's a riddle here. Think hard about it. And Job is silenced completely. <laughs> You see, here's Job, the enormous resources of the hippopotamus, and God says, that's you. I look, at, I look at my creation, and I see you like that, Job. Now, hippos, I mean, they're not all bad. There were some good things about it. I mean, they were extremely bad, and if marshaled in the right way, they could be extremely useful. But that wasn't all there was to Job, you see. That wasn't all there was to Job. Because if the hippopotamus is dangerous... In his own way, this thing is lethal. Untamable. So the, the crocodile, you can't touch him. Can't be bridled, can't be trusted, can't be managed, can't be overcome. There is nothing you can do. Do not try and use this animal for anything. If you, you try and keep this thing as a pet. I mean, uh, you know, uh, with, with pets we have, we develop a relationship with pets. And even, even people keep savage dogs, you know, and... And those dogs might attack everyone else, everyone else in town, but it won't attack the owner. This thing will attack the owner. There's just no question. He'll attack the owner. Now, you, you think about the crocodile. In Australia, they, go, you know, they might be 25 feet long. Big saltwater crocodile. They're very big. Six, eight hundred kilograms. Like, unbelievable things. And what do they do? Well, you think about it. What do they do? Well, they just sit there with their eyes above the swamp. A lot bigger than the alligators you have here. So they just sit there with their eyes above the swamp. How long do they sit there? All day. Do they move? They don't even blink. You go too close, straight out of the water at you. And they'll do that. They'll wait all day for you to come down to the riverbank. That's what sin's like. (laughs) It lies dormant. It does nothing. And when you're watching it, it does nothing. It knows when it's being watched. And you can walk around the edge of the river and you can watch it and when it sees that it, when it sees you looking at it, it'll do nothing. As soon as you go like this, that's sin, you see. Don't parley with sin. You can't control it. You can't tame it. You can't befriend it. It's not a pet. What do you do about this animal? All you can do is starve it. All you can do is starve it. The minute you try and feed it, what happens? It grows an inch bigger. Any lust that we have, any problem we have, you feed it, you give it any quarter, it'll grow. And let me tell you, the bigger they get, the more powerful they are. Job, can you control this? There's one of them living inside you. <laughs> you control that, Job. If you can deal with that, if you can put it down, then I'll confess you can save yourself. But unless you can deal with that, 
forget it. And look at him. He says here, this is a this is a key verse here, verse ten of chapter forty one. None is so fierce that dare stir him up. Who then is able to stand before me? If you can't control the crocodile, Joe, how can you possibly answer me, says God. Invincible to man, weapons are useless against him, and he's a king on earth. I mean, absolutely is he the king on earth today, as he's ever been, you see? And God's now presented Job the final, the final couple of animals, one which directly represents him as the hippopotamus, and one which in fact represents all of us. It, it says, you know, it, the, the hippopotamus is, is, what does he say? He's the, the uh, chief. He's a chief. And this behemoth, this, sorry, the Leviathan here, is the king over all the children of pride. So the hippopotamus is pride, and this fellow here is the king of pride. He even rules pride. Sin is over everything. That's the point, you see. And what God has done here is given Job his final answer. Remember I told you, I go back here, we had one question yet to answer? Well, here's the answer in the last speech of God. Job is proud. Job has helped the ecclesial world, but you know, there was a bit of satisfaction in that by Job. Not that Job was bad. I mean, understand, you know, we, we talk about Job like this. None of us are remotely like Job. But Job wasn't perfect, and there was a certain degree of pride in what he'd done. He was unable to control sin. If he could subdue these tendencies, then he could save himself. But he can't. But God can. And that's the point. And so salvation can only come by submission to the righteousness of God. And that's what Job had to learn. He was not more righteous than his maker. He could not do some of the things that God could do. And he had this animal living inside him, which in a very small way, only in a small way, but in a small way, he had been feeding. There was a problem there, you see. There was a problem. Well, Chapter 42, verse 1. Job answered Yahweh and said, Oh, I know that thou canst do everything and that no thought can be withholden from thee. Thou sayest, he's speaking and quoting God, Who who is he that hideth counsel without knowledge? Because this is what God's just said to him. Therefore have I uttered that I understood not, things too wonderful for me which I knew not. You're right, he says to God, I have said things I shouldn't have said. Here I beseech thee, and I will speak, God said. God said, I will demand of thee, and declare thou to me. Job says to that, well, I have heard of thee by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye seeth thee. Wherefore, I abhor myself in dust and ashes, he says. Now, now what does all this mean? Well, look, I'll show you pretty simply. Here was his first answer that he gave to God's first speech, and here was the answer that he gave to God's second speech. In the first speech, it says, Job answered and said, I'm vile, what shall I answer? I'll lay my hand upon my mouth. Once I've spoken, I won't speak again. I've got nothing more to say. Now, that's very similar to what he says in the second speech. In the second speech, he quotes God's words back to God, and then he says, he adds something. Sorry, he says, God can do everything. Then he quotes God's words back to God. Then he restates what he said in the first speech. He quotes God's words back to God, and he adds something else. So these two pieces in red are the new information that Job has added in his second speech that he didn't say the first time round. And this is the key bit here. I've heard of thee by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye seeth thee. As a result of that, I have poured myself and repent in dust and ashes. What does that mean? What does he mean when he says, I heard of thee by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye seeth thee? Or cast your mind back. When he got to the climax of his argument in Job chapter 19, what did he say? I know that my Redeemer liveth, what does he say? And that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth, and though worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God. I've seen him. You see? He's had his day in court. And he's now seen, not only the Shekinah above him, but the character of God revealed to him. He says, I've now seen God. 
And far from vindicating me, which is what I wanted back in chapter 19, he's put me back in the place I really belong. And I'm very sorry to have seen myself compared with that. I repent. Abhor myself. This is pretty strong language. I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. Well, brothers, this is the story's over. Job's now had his final answer from God, and a remarkable answer. Verse 7 of Job chapter 42, it was so that after Yahweh had spoken these words to Job, Yahweh says to Eliphaz the Temanite, Oh yes, they're still listening. My wrath is kindled against thee and against thy two friends. For you have not spoken of me that thing which was right, as my servant Job hath. Okay, a couple of points there. Firstly, clearly Job's argument has completely left the argument of the three friends behind. They look like immature children compared with Job. But look what God says about Job. You've not spoken of me that thing which is right, <laughs> as my servant Job has. What did Job say that was right? Job said pages and pages of things that weren't right. God winked at it. Forget it. Why? You're suffering. It's out of character. Forget it. All God's done here, you see, is Job had an almost perfect character, let's say, relatively, almost, compared with us. But there was one aspect in Job's character which needed cleaning up. And so God removes everything else and puts the magnifying glass on this little point and expands it like that so Job can see it very clearly, so that everybody can see it. And Lester friends said, oh, phew, we thought he was a bit of a hypocrite, we thought he was a bit self-righteous, God says... Well, between you and me, Job, there's a gulf like this between you and me. But now we understand that. Now let's put things back in perspective. Now you friends. <laughs> there's a gulf like this between you and Job, much less between you and me. You haven't spoken that which was right, like my servant Job. This is the infinite mercy of God, you know, a remarkable thing. God just winks at all of the stuff that Job said. It was out of character. Job didn't really feel like this. He was driven to it by being pushed into a corner by his friends. He comes out all guns blazing, but he sees now what he's up against and realises. And there will be an improvement, therefore, in the character of Job because of this. But a life has, you've got something to answer for. Verse 8, take unto you now seven bullocks and seven rams and go to my servant Job. Offer for yourselves a burnt offering and my servant Job will pray for you. And him will I accept, lest I deal with you after your folly, lest, you know, lest I become the God of exact retribution. And your stupidity meets an immediate response. That was their folly, wasn't it? This ridiculous doctrine of exact retribution. Well, just be glad that that doctrine's not true, life as otherwise you won't be standing here much longer. And if you go and offer that, well... I'll forgive you. You offer that sacrifice, Job will pray for you, and I'll hear him. So, verse 9, what could he do? Life has the Temanite, build at the Shuhite, Zophar the Namathite went, and they did according to as Yahweh commanded them, and Yahweh also accepted Job. I mean, they were brethren, of course they did it. They learned something as well, didn't they? And so, verse 10, Yahweh returns the captivity of Job when he prayed for his friends and gave him twice as much as he had before. In verse 12, that means 4,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, 1,000 yoke of oxen, 1,000 shasses. I mean, everything was doubled. And, verse 13, he had seven sons and three daughters. And he names the three girls in verse 14, the names that you can see there. But there's a problem, isn't there? Because he's only got ten children. He had ten children that he lost in chapter 1. What's happening? Oh, people are different to animals. The first ten, of course, will be in the resurrection. Job will have 20 children when he walks into the kingdom of God. But not, you see, not 20 children in the rest of this lifetime. And in all the land, there were none so fair as the daughters of Job, it says. And after this, verse 16, Job lived 140 years. Well, if that's a doubling of life, perhaps it was that Job was 70 years old when these calamities fell upon him. By no means an infant in the truth. He saw his sons and his sons' sons, even four generations. What does that say? He became a great tree with roots spreading out to the waters and a great canopy over his family. 
So Job died, being old and full of days. At, I suppose, 210 years old. A great man, brothers and sisters, became even greater. And as the divine author was to say, hast thou considered my servant Job?